Good afternoon, everyone. I'm David Van Slyke. I'm the Dean of the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 31st annual Herbert Laurie Memorial Lecture on Health Policy. I'd like to acknowledge with respect the Onondaga Nation, the fire keepers of the Haudenosaunee, the indigenous people on whose ancestral lands Syracuse University now stands. The Laurie Lecture is held in honor of Dr. Herbert Laurie, who is a distinguished physician and a member of the national and international medical communities in the field of neurosurgery. Dr. Lorry was a physician who understood medicine as a higher calling that demands the utmost of skill, intellect, compassion, and character. This lecture series is a wonderful opportunity to bring together our community and hear from and engage with a distinguished and thoughtful individual who is involved in the issues that animated Dr. Lorry's life. I'd like to thank the Central New York Community Foundation for their generous funding that makes this lecture series possible. And of course, the Lorry family for their abundant support throughout the years. I thank the Center for Policy Research, led by Professor Len Lopo and his team for hosting the annual Lorry Lecture. CPR is home to nationally and internationally recognized scholars who conduct a broad range of interdisciplinary research and other activities related to public policy. It houses both the Education Finance and Accountability Program and the Learner Center for Public Health Promotion, which Professor Shannon Monnet directs. Today's topic is particularly relevant. As most of us are aware, marijuana laws and regulations are changing rapidly across all 50 states. Today, we're gonna to hear from Dr. Keith Humphreys of Stanford University on the research findings and what it tells us regarding these changes. I'd like now to introduce you to the Learner Chair for Public Health Promotion, Professor Shannon Monnet, who will introduce our 2019 Lori Lecturer. In addition to her role with the Learner Center, Shannon is also an Associate Professor of Sociology here in the Maxwell School and the Co-Director of the Policy, Place, and Population Health Lab as part of the Aging Studies Institute. Shannon? Thank you, David. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming. Uh, I'd also like to put in a plug to thank the staff of the Center for Policy Research for coordinating the logistics of this event, in particular, Laura Walsh, for handling all the logistics, the flight, the schedule, getting everybody here. Uh, this couldn't be done without her, so thank you, Laura. I am pleased to introduce Dr. Keith Humphreys. Dr. Humphreys is the Esther Ting Memorial Professor at Stanford University and a senior research career scientist at the VA Health Services Research Center in Palo Alto. His research addresses the prevention and treatment of addictive disorders, the formation of public policy about addiction and mental health, and transfer of knowledge from clinical trials into clinical practice. He has published over 300 scientific articles, including papers in the New England Journal of Medicine, Science, JAMA, Lancet, and Addiction, all of the top journals in his field. He's also a regular contributor at the Washington Post. Recent provocative titles of his Washington Post columns include, How Jails Stay Full Even As Crime Falls, In Push for Marijuana Legalization, 2020 Democrats Side With Industry, and Relax Californians, Cheaper weed is coming. In addition to his scientific work, Dr. Humphreys has been extensively involved in the formation of public policy, having served as a member of the White House Commission on Drug-Free Communities, the VA National Mental Health Task Force, the National Advisory Council of the U.S. Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and the California Blue Ribbon Commission on Marijuana Policy. During the Obama administration, he spent a sabbatical year as senior policy advisor at the White House Office of Drug Control Policy. If you want more information about how fun that is, catch up with Keith later. He has also testified on numerous occasions in Congress, in state legislatures, and in the UK uh, Parliament. And he is a prolific tweeter. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Keith Humphreys, this year's Lori Memorial Speaker. Thank you very much, Shannon, and thank you uh, to the Maxwell School uh, for inviting me here. I'm a great admirer of this school. And, um, I, I like the, the problem-solving orientation of public policy schools, and um, 
this is one that has always stood out for me as one that really makes a difference in the world, understands that knowledge is there for the service of society and not for its own sake alone. Um, so I'm excited to be here, and I, and I was very interested to hear about Dr. Lori, who sounds like a much more amazing person than I am, so I'm not sure I can live up to uh, uh, that, but I'll do my best. Uh, my talk, Marijuana Legalization Beyond Yes or No, uh, it's obviously a hot political topic, but this is not a political talk. I am not going to take a political position. What I'm going to do instead is give you a policy research talk and, and talk about what are the different levers we could pull and what the impact might be. And uh, if, if there's any message, it's that it really isn't a yes or no decision. There are all kinds of different ways we could uh, manage this drug, uh, whether it's legal or illegal, and which, with different effects, and that we have all those choices, and we shouldn't narrow ourselves down between just a parity, you know, a war on marijuana on one end and uh, a copy of the tobacco industry on the other. There's, there's plenty of other choices. Um, and as I said, I'll leave that choice to you as voters. I am not someone who believes that the world would be better if everybody did what professors said, because I've been to faculty meetings. So, okay. So start with disclosures. Here you go. I think probably the most important thing is I, I have no financial stake in this. I've never had any connection to the cannabis industry, and I'm not planning to have any. I have done some consulting for a company that is trying to develop a medication that works on the same receptor as cannabis. Uh, and, uh, and the other thing I would say is that it, what I say are just my own views. They're not Stanford views, Washington Post views, or, or, or Department of Veterans Affairs views. I want to acknowledge someone. If you'd asked me to give this talk two years ago, I would have said, oh, you don't want me. There's someone much better, and he's right close to home, and that's Mark Kleiman, who was at New York University, and taught me uh, much of what I'm going to talk about. I learned from Mark. He really is one of the, once one of the great cannabis policy and drug policy researchers in the country, and very sadly, he passed away six weeks ago. I just wanted to dedicate uh, the, the talk to him and thank him for all he taught me, and also recommend this book, on which he was a co-author, um, Marijuana Legalization, What Everyone Needs to Know. It's a wonderfully accessible, intelligent book, and it really is. It lives up to its title. Every question you might have is in that book in a very accessible and intelligent uh, form, and I'd, I'd commend that to you. So um, what are we going to talk about? Well, I'll just give some basic concepts, and then I'll talk about what's going on in the world around cannabis. But I'm going to focus mostly on the United States, because we're in the United States, and also that's where we have the, most of the data. And then some policy recommendations to consider if, in fact, uh, New York chooses to legalize recreational cannabis. So here are the four, four terms I'm going to uh, just walk us through. Some of you may know these well, and so I'm so, um, sorry if this is some review. but. They're often used uh, sort of sloppily or incorrectly in the media, so it's worth spending time on each one. And those are decriminalization, legalization, commercialization, and normalization. So what do those things mean? So decriminalization is not the same thing as legalization. It's about the user, the person who smokes pot, you know, consumes the edible, and so on. It's focused on removing criminal penalties for that act, basically possessing and using cannabis for personal use. There are different varieties of it. Sometimes it's there's no arrest, but you still have to pay a parking ticket. Sometimes it's, uh, uh, you know, you have to do a court appearance, but as long as you do it, uh, your, your record will be waived, whatever. But the general idea is you're taking away those punishments and the things that go with them, like having a, a criminal record that can affect someone's ability to get a job or get a student loan, um, you're getting rid of that. What does it do to drug use? People often worry. If we, if we decriminalize, will everybody start using a lot more, more of a drug? The evidence seems to be maybe a little bit more. It's kind of a mixed literature, but maybe people will use a little more cannabis. But it's not a huge effect if it is there. And you kind of, it kind of makes sense to be a little bit of increase, because you could think of criminal punishments are like a cost that's really poorly distributed. So once people know they, they will, there's no chance they will have to pay that cost, there'll be at least some people who say, OK, I, I'd like to try this now, now that I know that I can't get arrested. So the effect on drug use is small, but the effect on arrests is huge, utterly huge. This is California data. We decriminalized in 2010, or both for adults and for young people, and you can see the drop there. That's just 12 months of data, 87% drop in uh, arrests. And it applied, you know, applies in the youth population, applies in the adult population. So that's almost every single arrest that we, we make in California, just like that. You basically say, we're not doing this anymore, and whoosh, it goes away. Um, and that's a, a pretty common finding. You can see that in other countries as well. There's a really nice study in Australia, Western Australia, 
where they went to something called cannabis expiation notices rather than arrests. They would write you up and say, you've done this thing, and, you know, they, they take the cannabis and say, but, you know, you, you, can, you can avoid any criminal sanction. And then they saw of the people who had one contact with the police around cannabis, how many got in contact with the police again, meaning something else bad happened. And it used to be a third of people would be repeat business, and it went to zero. So that's really taking cannabis users really out of contact with the police. And there are a lot of social welfare games from doing that. Both the police can do other things that many people would argue are more important. And second, again, you don't have the, the arrest damage, which, which can be substantially worse than the use of the pot. Some people worry about net widening, which is a concept from criminology basically saying if you make the penalty really modest, then police will start applying it more because, you know, maybe earlier they'd say, well, it's just a joint. I don't want to do anything. I don't want to give the person a clear record. And then if it becomes a ticket, they say, well, if it's just a ticket, I'll do it. Uh, but there's not much sign of that. If that's happening, it doesn't seem to be happening very much. Um, you know, replacing these, you know, expanding arrests or expanding fines to other places. So I'm honestly not too worried about that in this case. I think pretty much you can say if you decriminalize, you wipe out almost every possession of arrests. So what does it do? Um, just to summarize, it really cuts arrests if they were prevalent to begin with. Obviously, there are places that decriminalize as, formally as the end of a long process of not actually, uh, you know, in fact, practice, they're not enforcing that law anyway. But let's assume you were doing a lot of arrests. It really does uh, wipe those out. So then you have a value judgment. This is where the politics comes in. Maybe there's a, a little bit more cannabis use and a, and a lot fewer arrests. Do you think that's a good trade or not? Um, the reason use doesn't change, by the way, is because of something uh, the term Peter Reuter, who's a drug policy analyst, uh, describes as structural consequences of illegality for the industry. When you, when you decriminalize growing cannabis, promoting cannabis, selling cannabis, running a cannabis uh, business is still illegal. And so that makes cannabis less accessible and more expensive. It maintains that. All you're taking care of is the penalty on the user. And you can make those decisions separately. You don't have to have full legalization in order to achieve this, this change. Um, and the other funny thing is people often say cannabis legalization will reduce arrests. Weirdly enough, it won't. And, and, and this is why. If you had a state that had a really, really tough marijuana regime, they're arresting people like crazy, and they went straight to legalization, they would see that big fall in arrests. But the reality is states that legalize almost always have decriminalized first. Right? You, you know, if a state really is really wants to crack down on marijuana, they're not going to jump right into legalization. So uh, we, since you've already had that lunch, you can't have it again. So by the time legalization shows up to wipe out arrests, there just aren't that many left. And the kinds of arrests that you make under legalization too, like, you know, smoking pot in a school bus and things like that, that are always going to be, there'll be some penalty for them. Okay, so what about prison? If you, if you decriminalize, does it empty out the prisons? No. Um, the, the, when candidates say, um, I have a plan to get rid of mass incarceration in this country, I'm going to um, stop, rest, uh, I'm going to release all the pot smokers from prison. My reaction is, really, both of them? That's terrific. Awesome. People don't go to prison for smoking pot. Even if you take the most broad definition of a marijuana offense, like you include people who had 500 pounds of marijuana when they were caught and they had a gun and they were evading taxes and all that, you still only get to one or 2% of the American prison population. So you may want to release those people. I mean, that's an interesting debate to have, but if fundamentally you're leaving 98 to 99% of the prison population on the table. So changing cannabis policy, contrary to what it's I promised, is not going to alter the fact that we have 1.5 million human beings in state and federal prison. Okay, now let's go to legalization. So this is the full Monty, all right? So now not only are you saying it's okay to use, it's okay to possess for personal use, now you can grow it, sell it, run a business. Big change, production and supply become legal. It does something decriminalization doesn't, it creates competition for a black market. So if you decriminalize, people are still buying from criminals. If you legalize, at least in the long term, theoretically, the black market should shrivel because over time it can provide a cheaper product, people don't face any risk of arrest, and so criminals will go out of business. And that, and that you know, is a, uh, generally observed when you legalize a formerly illegal market. As for the other effects, 
it really depends on how you design it. And this is where it's really important to think through all the options you have and realize there may be more than you, more than you expect. This is a terrific, um, uh, what is that, figure from the RAND Corporation team. I think this is one was led by John Calkins and Bo Kilmer, but many of them were on it. And this just shows the range of all of the ways you can handle the supply part of cannabis policy. And it goes, you could just say, well, you know, from decriminalization, we'll say you can't do it, but we're going to lower the penalties. All the way over in the far right there is we're going to have like another big tobacco. We're going to have a whole private sector free for all. But there's many options in between. You could say, well, we'll let people grow it. So you, everybody's a legal producer. Or we'll just let adults grow it. Or we'll have clubs that grow it. This is what Spain does. Or we'll have a Dutch model. The Dutch have cafes that where you can legally consume cannabis, but you can't consume at other places. Or we'll have state stores. If you're old enough and you grew up in the right part of the country, you will remember that in a lot of the country after prohibition, the government used to run the, the liquor store. And they, the, in, in those states, they, those stores advertise less, they card more consistently, they, there's less drinking and so on. That, we could do that with cannabis. Or you could have um, public uh, benefit companies. In other words, you could say, okay, you can sell cannabis, but not, not as a for-profit. You have to be a public benefit corporation um, or a nonprofit. Or if you go private, you still don't have, you could license very strictly versus uh, loosely and so on. So there's, there's a huge range of options here. And one of the things I think that has been bad about our political debate is mainly we've been presented just with that one, the far right, standard commercial model. It's either that or lots of people getting arrested. And that's just not true. We, we have a lot more flexibility than that. So what is commercialization? Commercialization is a process that legalization makes possible, but is distinct. And that's when you bring in things like modern marketing and advertising and profit seeking and heavy promotion. And there's good evidence that this has unique effects from different than the act of just legalizing a business. And I can show you that by talking about the Dutch. The Dutch are the most terrific, if you are a policy nerd, you love the Dutch because they, they, they do things very carefully, they gather data and then they they, they pragmatically say, let's switch this and switch that and all that. So there's all this great data on cannabis, from, and they've been working on this for decades. But they had an experiment like this. So that when they set up the cannabis cafes, some people said, oh, the whole country, everyone's going to be high all the time. But actually, very little evidence that setting up these designated spots where people could legally consume cannabis changed their consumption that much. So that wasn't that big a deal. However, over time, that industry evolved and they started opening up more cafes and they started advertising including other countries and having two for one sales and all the things we associate with modern uh, commerce and then Dutch consumption tripled in a period where nowhere else in Europe changed and then the Dutch being Dutch said well we don't like that so they they, they crimped down on the, the commercialization aspect still kept the cafes they're there there as ever and showed that that um, use went back down. And now, now the Dutch rate of cannabis use is unremarkable. It looks like any other European country. This was documented by my colleague at Stanford, Rob McCoon. But that's as close as you can get, I think, to an experiment of the fact that you know, taking away the criminal sanctions is one thing, but sort of unleashing capitalism on a drug, what, what happens? And you don't have to do, as I, as I said, you don't have to do that. In fact, the Dutch have shown there's an alternative way. So last is normalization. And this is, normalization is, a process that isn't, we can't specify in policy, but it's shaped by policy. So just imagine if I came into this talk and my tie was like this, and I said, it's great to see you all. I'm really happy to be here in Syracuse. Um, it's like, what are you looking for? It's perfectly legal for me to wear my tie this way, right? But what you would be thinking is like, God, how did we get this speaker? This guy's a weirdo, right? <laughs> and then I would look at your negative verbal reaction and put my tie back down because I don't want to get that kind of reaction. Well, a huge amount of our conduct around substances has far more to do with this. Is it considered normal? If this were 1950, we would all be smoking uh, cigarettes. Now, now it's illegal, but even if it weren't illegal, lighting up a cigarette lots of places, people will look at you like, eh, gross, cigarettes. Or another one you may remember, if you're my age, is how people feel about drunk driving. People made jokes about drunk driving, you know, in living memory, no big deal to do it. And now, if you're wobbling out of a party drunk and say, I'm going to have one more for the road, everyone looks at you like, you know, you're a pariah. 
right? And th those things affect us a lot because we're far more in contact with other people than we are with the formal forces of law, right? So what happens if, if beyond becoming legal, cannabis becomes normalized? It becomes a banal thing, as, as common as, as someone to uh, say, I'd like a beer to have, to have cannabis. For me to have cannabis open display, maybe at my work site or in my office. And that will probably have effects of it on as well. And part of that will be on how people interpret what cannabis means in their lives and what a cannabis problem is. So I'm going to read you a story. This is, not a, this is a combination of some people, and you, it's, it's all anonymized. But imagine, imagine the situation. Sally is a 40-year-old accountant who was recently divorced. Her 16-year-old son, Richard, has seemed sad and low on energy since the marital breakup. Richard smokes marijuana every day, both before and after school. He has trouble sleeping and has also gained a large amount of weight. Both his friendships and his grades have deteriorated. So the question is, if you're the parent, what's wrong with my child, right? And there's a lot going on here, right? And it's kind of arbitrary. You know, real life clinical trials are always beautiful. The person has one problem and no other problem, and, you know, but in real life, you know, these things are a gamish, right? And things are all mixed up. So it's gonna depend in part on what's normalized and who Sally talks to and what, what they say. So may, if she talks to her neighbor, and let's say it's 1985, which is kind of the height of the American war on marijuana, and she says all these facts, her neighbor would say, I've heard pot, it's the pot. The kid's got a marijuana problem, you need to get him into addiction treatment, that's why he's depressed, that's why he's gaining weight, that's why he's doing bad in school. But if it's totally normalized, then probably a person wouldn't say that. They might say, well, you know, a divorce, it's, a, it's tough to deal with divorce, that's, that's all. Or kids, kids go through these phases. It's nothing. Or he's got an eating disorder. Or maybe he needs a tutor. He needs to learn how to study better, and so on. And any of those stories may be true or not true. I mean, we, we don't know which is, in fact, you know, his problem. But that's just, it, the point is just that whether we fully normalize and we come to a thing that using cannabis is banal, it will change how many people think about their problems, whether or not they seek help. Sometimes that will be good because it isn't the cannabis. And sometimes that will be bad because it, it is the cannabis, right? And uh, that, that force is, is wrapped up in all these other ones. Influenced by policy, and it's absolutely clear, industries try to normalize what their products are. They want to make, you know, GE brings good things to life and so on. They want to make these things normal, um, but they aren't fully controlled by policy actors. They're controlled by all of us and social processes. Okay. So what's going on out there on this wild planet of ours? Well, I've, I mentioned the Netherlands. They're still experimenting and, and trying different things. They've recently... Uh, decided that you have to have a Dutch passport to get uh, cannabis out of Dutch cafes, which is sort of interesting. So that means that some of the, are, you're nodding your head, no? Uh, no, pardon me? Only the ones around Dutch. Oh, yeah, yes, Ma yes, and Matt, I'm sorry, yes, you're right. In, yeah, yeah, Maastricht has done this. So, which actually creates some wonderful experiments because you have at the University of Maastricht, French and German students who have who've been exogenously assigned to not have as much access to cannabis. And so there's interesting research going on about how, do their grades change in the same classes as, as Dutch students. Spain has clubs uh, that um, you can use cannabis in legally. They have memberships. Uruguay has legalized. They sell it through pharmacy uh, system. Canada has legalized and the prob with the provinces allowed to have a, a fair amount of latitude of how they want to design it. And th those things, I think, are going to range from pretty free markety to a kind of state monopoly model. And then there's us. And then I'm going to spend the rest of the talk talking about us uh, because that's where we have the most, the most uh, data. OK, so I think exceptionalism, American exceptionalism gets a bad name, but sometimes it's warranted. We do seem to be different in, than any other country in the amount of freedom we give corporations to do what it is they'd like to do. And that's probably going to mean that our form of legalization will be different than what you would see in, in other countries. Um, so we're going to keep that in mind, um, and not to say we have to just yield to that automatically, but just assume that potentially what we do is not going to generalize to other countries, and what other countries do may not generalize to what we do. Right now, it's where we get all the data, almost all the good outcome data that we have uh, is from the US, with some exceptions. and. What, what is being done ranges from free-for-alls to pretty tightly regulated um, uh, systems. So uh, as I, I like to say, that let's not make a hash of it. Um, I had to make that joke because I'm a dad, so that, that was legally required. All right. 
So this is now, uh, I, I actually made these slides a couple months ago. It's now 11 states in the District of Columbia have legal recreational marijuana right now. Other states have medical marijuana that is so loose it's almost legal, and this was true in some of the legalization states before. It was, you know, you could pretty much get a, a access for almost uh, any reason and use as much as you wanted. Weirdly, it's still federally illegal, which creates some very uh, awkward situations. I mean, the federal government can, everything that's going on now is a federal felony, but the federal government's not doing anything at the moment. Um, but it raises questions about like interstate commerce and what about banking and all these kinds of things, but that's just the way it is. Mostly what's happened in the US is on a for private for-profit model. Um, you can see some exceptions, although they're, they're both under threat, but Vermont and DC where you possess it, you can give it away, but you can't run a business and selling it. And the longer term trends in the US are, you know, decriminalization and normalization. So if you look at, um, how much people are smoking, it's, it's about doubled the volume of consumption in the last 10 years or so, and yet the, and the, the amount of arrests per use have gone down uh, quite a bit. So it, more generally, even outside the states, you're seeing a move away from the sort of legal uh, management of this drug. So what's going to happen? What is going to be the public health impact of this? So I'm going to talk about six things. What happens to prices and why they collapse? What does that mean for taxes? And what does that mean for revenue? Where we are with potency of the drug? What's going on with people who are heavy users, meaning they use every single day or almost every single day? I'm going to talk a bit about drug substitution. And then last, treatment. Will people come in to seek uh, cannabis uh, uh, treatment anymore or not? So probably the most important thing to know about legalization is <coughs> it causes a price collapse. It, a word like decline or drop doesn't, it's a collapse. Um, as, as fast as 2% per month. And this is really the extraordinary thing about prohibition is, you know, it is just a weed. It's a reason, you know, we call it weed, right? And yet it sells for the price of a precious metal under illegality. And how, does, how could that possibly be the case? Well, as soon as you take it away, you see this extreme drop. This is Washington State data. I published this in Washington Post in 2017. It's gone down since. Here's, uh, that, that, this is data per gram. Here's uh, wholesale prices in Colorado. Um, that's actually down now another third, so it's about $900 a pound in Colorado. Um, and these are, just gonna, these are just gonna continue to fall. So this is hugely important for multiple reasons. Um, how low could it go? Way, way, way more lower. So this is a calculation by uh, John Calkins, who's a co-author on that book with uh, Mark Kleiman. Cannabis yields about 1,000 pounds per acre. So you think, what does it cost? What's the production cost for an acre of typical agriculture? Well, if you look at tomatoes, it's about 10,000 bucks. And you still can convert that in and say, you know, we can probably produce cannabis for a couple pennies per gram. And, it, and a typical, Americans roll their joints at about 0.4, roughly, grams per, per joint. So that, that means like a joint would be like two, three cents. And, and, you know, Jonathan makes the analogy, it would be, it could be as, as, like the beer nuts they leave for you at the bar, something they don't even charge for, or the chocolates they put on, put on your pillow. And we're down to actually 10 per gram, or now 9 per gram, so there's still a long way, a long, long way to fall. It is possible that prices are going to fall another, they've already fallen, you know, 60, 70, 80, 90 percent. They could easily fall another 60, 70, 80, 90 percent. All right, why does that happen? Well, it's... I'll tell you a couple different things. So let's start with a scenario about work. Let's say you are, some of you are probably students at Syracuse. You're looking for a summer job. I run a furniture store in downtown Syracuse. And I say, here, I want to hire you. All you have to do, you stand in a showroom. People come in. You tell them about the furniture. If they like the furniture, you sell it to them. OK? And they say, what do you think a fair wage is? And I don't know what the going wage is for a job like that in, in Syracuse. $14 an hour, say. Hold whatever the right wage is in your head. And you say, yeah, okay, I'll do it for $14 an hour. I say, oh, good, I should add a few more details. All the furniture's stolen, and you could go to prison for selling it. And there's another furniture store down the street, and that guy doesn't like me, and he has a gun. So you might want to get a gun, and whatever you do, do not call the police, right? <laughs> now how much money do you want to be paid? You're not going to do that for $14 an hour, right, if you're going to even do it at all. So labor. You, you, you get far fewer people who are willing to participate as, as labor, and you've got to pay them to compensate them for the risk. You also have the thing is you have to operate secretly versus at scale. 
So standing on a street corner selling crack in Baltimore, you might only do like 10, 15, 20 deals a day. But a scanner in the supermarket, you know, can scan, you know, that many items in a few seconds because they can be out, out in public. Contract enforcement. If you're a business, you have contract. Where someone rips you off, you have access to the courts and the police. You don't have any of that with an illegal business. You can't walk in the police and say, you know, I, I, I delivered this really top quality heroin and a guy didn't pay me. I want him arrested. Can't do that. You have to say, all right, we're going to get a bunch of guys together and we're going to go try to get, our, get our, uh, our money back. That costs money and involves risk. And then, and then the other thing is you have uh, marketing expertise, which both you know, makes your product more appealing, but also lets you advertise on the basis of price much more efficiently. So you can let, every, when you have a, a great deal and you're a dealer out there and it's illegal, people may not know, but you can put ads on TV, here's our prices, someone else may undercut you, and so on. So all of those things are going to make this cheaper, make the weed cost like a weed, basically. So that has big implications for how states design their taxation. A big reason a lot of people voted for marijuana legalization is not because they cared that much about marijuana legalization, because they thought they were going to get money, um, tax revenue. So you can imagine this. You have a product that's falling in price really fast, and you pass a 20% tax. And you say, it's going to be great, because we got $400 an ounce. We're going to sell a million ounces a year. We take 20% of that, and we're going to build a bunch of highways and schools. And then a year later, it's $300 an ounce. OK, well, it's, that's not as much, but we'll still be. Now it's $200 an ounce. Then it's $100 an ounce. And maybe it goes down to nothing. So, ne so you're at left saying, well, if somebody buys a, a two joints, we put a penny tax on that, and we'll, we'll, we'll you know, do something with that penny. So you chase, chase things down to the bottom. Uh, ad valorem taxation depends on you know, the price not dropping. This happened in Colorado. They raised the, their rate on cannabis. And in 12 months, the decline in the market canceled out all the added re revenue. So the way to handle this, and the people who worked on the New York law had thought this through, to their credit, is to tax in different ways. You can tax based on weight, X per ounce, X per gram. Or you could put a minimum unit price, is another way to do it, where you say, you know, marijuana, we don't want marijuana to sell for a penny a, a joint. We're going to say the minimum price a, a legal merchant is allowed to charge is a dollar a joint or something like that, which both reduces use but also then gives you more tax revenue. Now, the downside of doing that is potentially on the potency side. If I'm going to be charged per weight, maybe I just try to grow like 80% product all the time. So you do have to think about then also adding something that would discourage people from doing high potency, and there's different ways to do that. Let me talk more about potency in general. Um, Marijuana is a lot more potent than it used to be. Uh, the, the, the average, we have very good data now. State of Washington, I think on the first 30 million sales, puts the average THC at about 20% or so. Uh, THC is the principal intoxicant in the drug. So depending how old you are, you may have a perception of cannabis that is different than what the, the current products are. If you used it in the 70s or the 80s or whatever, and it's been going up and up and up. And there's some products that go way higher than 20%, um, you know, 60, 70, 80, 90%. We don't actually know what they do. Um, but there's some, you know, potential risk here. We don't know. It's just, just as you would be more worried if you caught your child with a bottle of vodka than a bottle of beer, um, you, you might be more rationally worried about a product that's 20% versus 4% or 3%. Um, yeah, so it's, yeah, it's tri triple THC content, and CBD, which is another component of the plant, has halved. And that's partly worrisome because it's not for sure, but it's possible CBD can temper some of the potential negative effects of THC. Uh, the other thing that is a bit worrisome is how people are using the drug. So more people are smoking cannabis now since legalization, but not a lot more. What's driving the increase in the volume of consumption is really, really heavy use. So it's, it's not so much that there are more people smoking cannabis once a week, it's that there's a lot more people who used to smoke it once a week who are now smoking it every day. And which this may be connected to falling prices and, and increasing potency. But you can see this, this data here. Overall, so the green line, is this a, yeah. So that's how many people have used it in the last year over a very long period. That's gone up a little, you know, it's like twice as high, but you're probably not going to sweat too much about that. But this has gone up tenfold, people who use all day or nearly every day. And that's new. They were a much smaller part of the cannabis using population uh, in the past. It's interesting, too, this is a, a slide from Jonathan uh, Calkins comparing 
people who drink every day versus people who use cannabis every day, the ratio between those two used to be 10 to 1. And now it's almost even as many people using cannabis every day as use alcohol every day. And we know that for most drugs, if you use them a lot more, you're going to you have higher risk of enduring some kind of harm. And you know, just to do the math on these things, so imagine you go back to somebody who's one, one joint on a weekend night with, with the old pot. So 4% THC is a typical, that's what users report is their typical size of joint. That works out to consuming an average of 4.6 milligrams of THC a day. But if you have somebody who's in the Washington market and they're one of these daily near daily users, they're consuming 300 milligrams of THC per day. That's about 60 times as much. And if you want another analogy, that is the same difference between chewing a coca leaf off the plant in Colombia and using cocaine. So it's a big change. And that also means a lot of what we, quote, know about the effects of cannabis is probably wrong because it's based on these older, weaker cannabises, which people didn't use as much. So there, 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 if there's more harm here, we would not necessarily know it yet. We'll find out as if people have problems. So if there are increases in harm, maybe they'll be traded off by reductions in problems with other substances. So if cannabis legalization led to, say, a doubling of cannabis use, but alcohol use dropped by a quarter, we would probably be ahead because alcohol is so criminogenic. I mean, we'd have less violence, we'd have less car accidents. People might say, that's a good trade, I'll, I'll sign up for it. So is that true? Well, there are a few studies showing that in geographic areas, these are ecological studies, where, where cannabis has been, medical cannabis has been legalized, for example, that alcohol consumption is lower than expected and opioid overdoses are less prevalent than expected. Um, but these are not very believable studies. And just, I'm going to do the math. This is done by Theodore Caputi, I think it's, but just a demonstration of, of why I'd be skeptical. So there's a study claiming that medical cannabis reduced population alcohol consumption by 15%. Okay, so 15% of U.S. alcohol co consumption is almost 100 million gallons of pure ethanol, which is 205 billion standard drinks. Now, the, about 2.5% of Americans use medical cannabis. So you have to have 2.5% of Americans reducing their drink by over 200 billion per year. And that means that the average user of medical cannabis would have to cut their cons alcohol consumption by 3,000 drinks a year, if that is correct. And for any one of them who didn't drink to begin with, someone out there needs to cut their drinking by 6,000 drinks a year. <laughs> so. I don't believe those studies. I still think it is possible that it could be substitution effects, but these aggregated correlational state-level studies, anyone, um, I'm sure there's lots of people in the room who teach epidemiology or statistics know that um, there's a lot of hazards in taking those at face value. The other hope is uh, um, could it reverse the opioid epidemic, uh, uh, cannabis use? And this is a very common headline. This one was written by a reporter I like tremendously, Amanda Chicago Lewis, although I don't agree with her on this point. But this got a lot of press and play. Um, and uh, we, our group actually just replicated these, or tried to replicate these results using more data. Uh, and we published this in uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences about a month ago. And what it showed that is when the initial studies were done, which was here, this is the, these are the uh, confidence intervals, so here's the, the effect. When those initial studies were done, that was like at this point, it was true, if you're below the line, that's negative, that states that had medical cannabis had lower than expected rates of opioid overdose. But when we followed it forward, it actually switches and goes the other direction at this point. Now, we don't think that means medical cannabis is killing anybody. Uh, we just think this is why, this is sort of a textbook spurious association. Um, we don't think, so we don't think it was saving lives. We don't think it, it's, it's killing people there. But again, the evidence on that is really wobbly, and promising people that is a mistake. And I, I go even further, since I'm in New York, it's a terrible mistake of the New York Medical Board to say uh, that medical, an indication for medical cannabis for people who are, on, who are addicted to heroin and are taking an FDA-approved medication like buprenorphine or methadone can uh, switch off that and take medical cannabis. That is really dangerous, and I think it's quite disappointing that New York State allows that, um, because that's a standard of proof we would not accept, in my opinion, for any other population other than people who are addicted to drugs. So 
The other thing about correlations is if you're going to believe some, you've got to believe all of them. So, you know, if you're going to look at these early studies which showing medical cannabis correlates with fewer opioid overdoses, well, there's other correlational studies. People in pain who use medical cannabis in addition to opioids use more opioids than those who don't. In the, in the national population, medical cannabis users have higher rates of prescription drug, drug misuse than non-users. Cannabis use predicts increased likelihood of developing prescription opioid overdose or opioid use disorder over time. These are all correlational studies. So there are people who say, well, these are causal, and that's just correlation. And other people say, that's the proof I was looking for, that's causal, but these, puh, correlations, we all know that's not causal. I just say, you've got to go all in on this, all right? If we're going to deal with correlations, we've got to accept the fact that they go in different directions, and so it's pretty hard for an honest person to say, we've proved this causal link when we have the correlations going in, you know, opposite directions in multiple studies. Uh, you, have to, you have to be cherry-picked pretty rigorously to come to that conclusion. So right now, we've got a lot of weak, overhyped science saying that it's going to solve the alcohol problem and the opioid problem. There's a lot of, by the way, corporate interests at play on this. Weed maps took out billboards, you know, you know, saying this will stop the opioid epidemic. It will save thousands of lives if you legalize cannabis, which incidentally would also make them a lot of money. I think it's really important we have to protect the integrity of science and all this and just call them as we see them and not, not uh, steer towards a corporate interest or an ideological interest, but just say what the facts are. I coming to feel particularly, I don't want to get on to climate change except for this one thing, I think protecting the, the integrity of science and the public perception of scientific worth might, might make us live or die as a species. I really believe that. And on problems that are far, you know, Climate change is an infinitely more important problem than cannabis. If we made cannabis one of the four food groups and use it every day, it would still not be as bad as climate change. And a, and a big challenge we have with climate change is people just don't believe scientists anymore. So I'm, I'm a, a evangelical of we need to call them as we see them. And at the moment, we cannot claim that cannabis will stop the opioid epidemic or stop problem drinking. Maybe someday we'll be able to do that. That's fine. But right now, that is not a responsible thing to say. Okay, here's another question. Will people still seek help for cannabis use disorder treatment? If it's legalized and normalized, so you think of that young man and, and his mom looking at him, if it just becomes a normal thing, maybe people will think, well, cannabis can't harm me, so any problem I'm having couldn't possibly be connected to all this cannabis I use, so I don't need any treatment. And there is an argument that the only pe reason people ever go to seek cannabis treatment is because the police make them. You know, they get arrested with cannabis in their car, and the, and, and the lawyer says, you know, if you enter treatment, we'll probably the judge will like it, and you won't get punished. And so you go, but you don't really buy it. Is that, is that the way we're going to be? Well, it's an interesting finding here. This is by Steve Davenport. And of this daily, near daily user group, they report lower rates of cannabis use disorder symptoms. When you ask them about things like, it's interfering with my life, it's causing social problems, causing work problems, I'm having trouble controlling it, I end up using more than I want to, all those kinds of things. It's sort of interesting. Now, there's, there's multiple ways to explain this. Maybe it's true. Maybe once it becomes legal, you don't endure those legal harms, so it is, in fact, objectively less harmful. Or when it's normalized, your spouse is less likely to criticize you for your heavy cannabis use, and so, in fact, it is less harmful. Maybe that's true. But the other possibility is it's just becoming normalized and people aren't drawing connections that objectively they should. They're having problems because of their heavy cannabis use, but they think it can't possibly be that because cannabis doesn't cause problems. Here's treatment data. This is from a, a post thing. And of two types, these are, these are thousands of people who are forced into treatment by the legal system. And these are people uh, who, who come to treatment otherwise. And you can see this thing is shrinking pretty fast. The, the court systems are directing fewer and fewer people into uh, cannabis use disorder treatment. But the rough amount of people seeking treatment overall has stayed pretty flat. So the only way that could be explained is fewer people are being forced in, but more people are choosing to come in, which is interesting, sort of opposite of what some people would have predicted, um, which suggests also that some people are experiencing harm. Um, and it's not just here. This is, this is uh, British data on why are people coming into treatment. And there's very little legal pressure to seek treatment in the UK. Here is first time treatment seekers, and here are repeat treatment seekers. And you know, cannabis is number two among first time. And overall, it's if people who go the most, it's, it, it's cannabis. And they have very strong uh, cannabis over there as well. So this could be a sign that people are, in fact, experiencing harm. 
um, of in in uh, the continent of the countries, the country that has the highest rate of voluntarily seeking treatment for cannabis use is the Netherlands, and where there's zero pressure to seek treatment from the legal system. So let's say, you, how, how much time do, more do I have? <coughs> Fifteen minutes. Okay. So now let me talk about New York. Um, these are some things one could consider if you decide to do this. I'm, and again, I'm not exhorting you to do it. I'm exhorting not to, but saying here are some considerations I hope would enter in your mind as if you go forward you, as you design your regime. And this comes from a paper uh, that uh, uh, I worked on with my uh, postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Chelsea Shilver, that will be out pretty soon. So let's talk first about what is, the, what is an optimal regulatory structure. Our view is you shouldn't have a medical system unless it is, in fact, medical. So, yeah, which, yeah, duh, but yeah, all right. Um, but the, the kind of faux systems where we had in California where pretty much anyone can get it for anything um, is actually bad for, for public health because people attribute medical knowledge status to that industry and it doesn't actually have it. So there was a study where, uh, recently where a researcher had women pose as pregnant uh, women and they called dispensaries and said, and 80 percent of them said you need to smoke cannabis during your pregnancy. So that's not good medical advice. And if a doctor did that and then the child had a problem, the doctor would be liable in some way, but the industry is not. So you'd say it, rather than, I mean, you got to remember medical, if people who did this in California, which was the first state, they were very candid. They were doing this to legalize, not, not because they really believed it was fundamentally medicinal. And it's, you know, and, but now we have legalized, right? So. I think we need to go back and say, why do we have this? Is it beneficial? Is it harmful? Now, if some would say, but there's health benefits to cannabis. That's fine. There are. There, there's, there's multiple therapeutic things that, that are come out of the plant, and there'll probably be more. But there's plenty of healthful products that we don't sell through medical dispensaries. I mean, for example, if you have chronic urinary tract infections, you might drink cranberry juice because it, it um, uh, makes the, uh, your urine more acidic, and that makes you less likely to get the infection. But we don't have cranberry juice dispensaries. You buy it in the same stores as people who buy it because they like the taste of cranberry juice. Right? So there's, it's not clear to us that there needs to be the separate system. It's better to put it all together and regulate it like a consumer product and not give it the medical name, unless, in fact, it truly is medical. And there's some states where it is medical, where like you have to have multiple sclerosis or, or end-stage cancer, and then you get it from a doctor. That's different. But these sort of faux medical things we think are bad. Um, um, we would like people to think about state monopolies. So again, it depends on your age, if you remember this. I grew up with this for alcohol. It was called an ABC store. There were still private companies that made all the, you know, beer, liquor, and wine that you have everywhere else, but you had to buy it at a store that was run by the government. And there's a lot of literature on the impact of that. States that had that had lower rates of young people drinking. They had lower rates of vehicular death from drinking. Those stores did less promotions. They carded more consistently. Government also employs people of color at far higher rates than the private industry. The cannabis industry is very white. So there's a lot of gains potentially from doing that. And I'd like to see a state or two try that with cannabis. Let the state, so the state would have state stores, and that's what they would sell. If we go full commercial, uh, I would hope the licenses would be restricted. In other words, there is, as with liquor stores, there is some point, both in terms of public health harm but also community amenity, where you, you can have just too many liquor stores or too many vape shops. And the way you handle that is through licensing. Make the license you know, hard to get. You can have the outlets so people can get what they want, but you also don't have you know, 50 of them all on the same street in some neighborhood. A common thing that is said that is really silly is we're going to have really loose regulation at the beginning, but we'll tighten it up over time. Because as you know, once a corporation is really powerful and wealthy, regulation is easy. Come on. That makes no sense. That's exactly backwards. The, you, the chance to get in strong regulations are the, the greatest on the very first day. Uh, Ten years from now, when you're on the other side of a table in Albany against a, a billion dollar industry, your chance of tightening it up even modestly are pretty hard. So it makes much more sense to build strong, and then you can loosen up over time if you need to. But you, you should not count on we'll tighten up later. That is not the observation you would make about pharmaceuticals, alcohol, tobacco, really any legal drug. If you have a for-profit industry, if you decide, okay, we, we, we're, we're, we want to be private sector types, 
don't let them set their own rules. So, you know, there's states where the oversight board has the industry on it. You would never, you know, if, if you saw a state say, we're going to have a tobacco control agency that's going to focus on uh, uh, reducing uh, smoking among kids, and, and the people on the board are going to be our good friends from Philip Morris, you would go, well, that's crazy. That's the fox guarding the hen house. But there's still, some of that's still going on with the design of some of these regulatory mechanisms. We need to start thinking about the cannabis industry as an industry. It will not be run by gentle hippies wearing tie-dyes who put money aside to save the whales. And I, I, I can tell you, and I, I find those people wonderful to be around. There's nothing against hippies at all. But I was really struck. I was in New York at the Cannabis Summit. And the people running the industry are white guys in suits who have law and business degrees. And they don't like hippies. They think they're off-brand. And they don't like social justice. They like profit and sales. This is an industry. And some of the biggest investors in it, by the way, are the tobacco and the alcohol industry. So. If you have it in your head, they're going to just automatically do the right thing because they're really gentle, anti-materialistic people. No way. Um, You've got to think they're going to be doing what industries do. They're going to be trying to make as much money. Usually that means you need to you know, produce as much heavy consumption as you ca can. And on the other side, we have interests in regulating them tightly as an industry. I think it's going to be important for, again, back to the integrity of science, for us to have all the disclosure rules that we have around alcohol, tobacco, and pharmaceutical money need to apply to the cannabis industry. My journal, which I edit for the Americas, Addiction does this. We treat it like any other industry. It doesn't mean they can't, people can't produce research and so on, but you have to say in there so people know this research was funded by the cannabis industry. Ditto, I'd like to see that in uh, all lobbyists disclosing. I, I would like not to go to hearings and see somebody, an independent health expert who was funded by the cannabis industry, not have to identify themselves as such. I, I, I hate it when that happens. Um, and in terms of funding research, that's really important. I think the government has a responsibility to fund cannabis research. And we do fund a lot of it. And I think it's just better that way um, about harms and benefits. And uh, so that's really important to maintain that, that it not just be done at the corporate level, because their, their incentives are different than the incentives of good science. What about different product regulation? So people, I, I have good friends who disagree with me on this, but I think we should do something to restrain potency. I, I, I don't think there really is a strong case to have a 50, 60, 70, 80% product. Um, and I think most people will be satisfied with lower end products. A lot of the you know, panic attacks, emergency room stuff is from those really, really strong products. Um, we can do that. We do that with other products. You can't, you can't make 150 proof beer and call it beer. You literally can't. I mean, the, the laws of states will say a beer is an alcoholic beverage that is in this range, right? And we could do that with these. We could say, you know, there's whatever, there's the beer pot and wine pot and you know, liquor pot, whatever, but you have to be in this range. It's not infinite because high potency is potentially more addictive, more harm. So we should, I, I believe we should, we should uh, be comfortable capping that. We should also just be honest about how little we know. I mean, health people, I mean, we have a lot of longitudinal studies of the impact of cannabis, but by definition, if I have a 20-year study of the effect of cannabis, it has to be old cannabis because it started 20 years ago. So it's sort of scary. I mean, I hope, maybe it'll turn out it's not that bad. I really hope so. I, I definitely don't want to be an alarmist, but most drugs, when you take them a lot more at much higher potencies, they're worse for you. So I, I have anxiety about that, and we have to be upfront when we give people health information and say, just remember, a lot of this is based on a much weaker product than you're consuming right now. We can also do some things here with taxes. So uh, alcohol is taxed more when it's stronger. We could do something like that, and you know, instead of a potency cap to say, you know, for, for the, the, on the corporate side, you know, if you want to make that really strong product, you're going to endure a tax bite. Maybe you'd rather make a more moderate one. Or if, it, or if you do say, no, I want it, put the high tax on it, then people will use it less because it costs more. The last idea which some people are pushing, and this may be right, if it turns out that this THC-CBD ratio proves to be important for health, we could tax it on that basis. We could say if you make a really pure THC, no CBD, we're going to tax that more than if, it's, if they're closer together because we think that's less harmful. But we need to do some more science to find out if this is, in fact, true. Um, we could keep these products separate. I'm pleased. I, every, every state I've advised on this, I have said, please, please do not let them make tobacco, cannabis uh, blended products. And so far, virtually every state has done that. Um, you could still, you know, they're all legal, but, um, you know, if you think of the amount of trouble someone will go to make a blunt, do you know what a blunt is, which is basically carving out a cigar 
and then filling it with cannabis. Okay? So if people are willing to do that, that sort of tells you, you know, these are two great tastes that go great together. And people are really willing to work hard to get that combination of drugs. It's very common in Europe to blend them. So you know, if you're a company, you would say, let's make you know, pre-blended, packaged, cannabis, tobacco, blended cigarettes, and they'd be very popular, but that would be bad. That would bring back tobacco consumption, and, and reducing tobacco consumption is one of the great successes of public health in my lifetime. So we keep those things separate so they don't feed each other. And it's going to be hard because it's roughly the same population. If you look at the economic, educational profile of the population that uses cannabis, it overlaps an awful lot with the population of people who smoke combusted cigarettes. Could also do things to restrict uh, flavors and products. I mean, there's a lot of things out there that are just ridiculous. I mean, they really are. Like, they look like kids' candies, and they're full of THC. I don't see any need for us to do that. Um, you, know, you could put those restrictions in. It, I, I think it will probably reduce accidental poisonings. And adults will still be able to use cannabis, even if it's not in the form of a gummy bear. This is a news story from the Canadian thing, just to point out when people say, you know, will it be like the cannabis or alcohol industry? Well, at least in Canada, it's probably going to be a division of those industries. But 1.8 billion for big tobacco, just the beginning. And you know, they, they are very well poised to do this. They have the land, they have the technology, they have the rolling machines, they own the shelf space in all the stores. Um, they have the advertising uh, ex uh, expertise and the people on contract. So it's very possible that if we don't, you know, that this would be the future, that you know, the big tobacco would have a cannabis division. And, and maybe you're okay with that. If so, that's your right. But I, at least my, my judgment of big tobacco is that it's been a health and regulatory disaster. So I, I view that with dread. We can prevent price collapse. Uh, you know, we, uh, Prices will come down some, but there's no need to have one cent joints. I mean, some will say that's great, one cent joints, but you got to think, you know, you can have a lot more use and you can have a lot more use among younger people. They're the most price sensitive. That's what we learned from taxing tobacco. There's different ways to do that. You can put taxes on it, you can assign a minimum price, um, you can tax by weight, as I mentioned, but I think it's worth it to make sure that it isn't as cheap as those nuts in the bar. Um, there's a lot to be done on marketing. You know, the, it, it's hard. You know, it, U, U.S. law all the way up to the Supreme Court treats commercial speech like you know free speech, and whether whether one likes it or not, that's the way it is. But you can still put in limits of marketing towards children. That's well established in law. It's going to have to be done pretty sophisticatedly. One of the problems is, you know, a typical person in Congress is like 60 years old, and so they think, okay, that means TV shows can't have cannabis ads until nine o'clock, and they don't realize people don't watch TV by the clock anymore. They watch it on their phones whenever they feel like watching it. Because we're more sophisticated about keeping these away from uh, young people because it, the, you know, the incentive of the industry, of course, is to get people to start using them young. We might consider a plain packaging requirement, which is being done for some tobacco, and that would take away a lot of the incentives for companies to build brands. Um, it's worth considering. What social outcomes? I think we have to make some decision about public consumption, and I'm not, there's more than one way to argue this. So, you know, we don't want pe people blowing smoke out, secondhand smoke, people have a legitimate reason to um, not want to be exposed to that. It's far less than tobacco. The typical person who, who smokes cannabis who smokes far fewer, you know, joints per day than a tobacco smoker smokes cigarettes a day, but it is there. Um, we know that where kids congregate, having smoke-free zones, is good in terms of reducing their likelihood of initiating tobacco. So we could at least say in those zones you would not be able to smoke cannabis. And we may also want to, but we may want to designate locations like cannabis clubs, for example, where people can smoke, but separate them out from other substances. So um, you know, in, in the Dutch, for example, you can buy the cannabis there, but you can't buy alcohol. We might want to try that model to try to keep those habits from feeding each other. Driving impairment is a big issue that we really don't know what to do with at the moment. We don't know how to measure whether someone's impaired. THC is lipophilic. It sticks around the body much longer. It's much harder to assess. Um, uh, it's much harder to assess whether someone's in fact intoxicated than it is with alcohol. Nonetheless, we should learn everything we can from the experience of, of drink driving, um, and also put a lot of R&D into developing a reliable field test like we have for alcohol, um, so that you know. You know, people don't kill each other on the on the roads. And until I get my pension, I'm always going to end with more research is needed. So, <laughs> a lot of research, big grants, big big grants. <laughs> but here are some things where where it's needed. We need to know a lot more about new cannabis. Okay, it's barely been studied. What do these products do? 
um, what happens when people use them every day versus once in a while? What happens when a teenager uses them every day when they're in their peak of brain development? What are the health effects of different modes of administration? That's another level of real complexity here. You know, you can smoke it, you can vape it, you can eat it, um, you can consume it as a wax or an oil. Um, what, what, what are all those different effects? We, we really don't know, so we need to study those things. Um, we need to study legalization more in the states. A lot of work has been done, but I think we need, need to look at like different populations of people and how they're affected. And then we need the substitution question. Like I said, this, the research now doesn't support any conclusion, but you know, some better research, it, knowing whether or not particularly alcohol consumption changed, and I hope it goes down, that would be really important. I guess it would be very important to know if it goes up too. I hope that's not the case. But that's a really, really important thing to figure out, whether, whether there's a substitution effect, because there could be massive social welfare consequences one way or the other based on that uh, particular phenomenon. All right, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay. So, Thanks, Doctor. Is, does there seem to be, based on your research, any correlation between the price of opioids like heroin uh, and marijuana? Is there, a, is there anything connected there? I don't think we, I, you know, that, that was a claim from years ago, you know, it, starting on people use heroin started using cannabis, which was true, but tons of people use cannabis who never use heroin. So the closest thing we have is not with heroin, but with prescription opioid misuse. And this is a longitudinal study by Mark Olson, who's at Columbia, showing that uh, following people over years, people who had uh, cannabis use at the first wave a couple years later were more likely to be misusing prescription opioids. Now, there's lots of reasons that could be happening, but that's the closest thing we have on that particular question. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Can you comment on uh, the illegal market for marijuana and how legalization or decriminalization has impacted that, if we have any knowledge? Okay, so the question was, What's going on with the illegal market, and has decriminalization or legalization impacted it? Decriminalization, the answer is easy, no. If, if anything, decriminalization may actually help illicit markets. You say, now, why would that be? Because the price is as high as ever, and you may get a few more customers. Not a big effect, but maybe a little. So for like the Sinaloa cartel, they're fine with decriminalization. Legalization, at least theoretically, of any black market should shrink the black market over time um, because you're, you're going to get a legal, safe, cheaper product at higher quality. That's, that's the idea, and that most people won't do it. And also, a lot of people, there's a declarative effect of law. Some people just, I want to obey the law. But so far, black markets have been pretty persistent in a lot of these places. Partly, I think that's because there were problems in the rollout initially, so there wasn't enough supply. Partly because people haven't figured out yet that you still have to do enforcement. So, um, and it's, it's, sort of, it's interesting, this is just about the cultural politics of it. Mark, my, my, my late friend Mark Kleiman and I said in Washington State, that you realize you're still gonna have to arrest black market dealers. And they go, no, 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 no. War on drugs is over, man, we're not doing that. So like, then why would anybody get a license? Right? I mean, that's why we come right out and call it a license, because you're licensed to do things other people aren't doing. And at some point, the industry is going to say, wait a minute. We bought these licenses, we paid for these businesses, we're obeying all these rules, and someone's standing right outside selling illegally, arrest them. And it, that will collapse pretty quickly, I think, with a small amount of enforcement. But with total impunity, um, that, that black market dealer will, will continue to work. And so I think there's that sort of evolution process realizing it's not the same we stop people from moonshining, you know, alcohol that makes you blind. That, that, that doesn't mean we're fighting a war on alcohol, right? And so the same thing needs to, that sort of needs to work through people's head about cannabis. Yeah, I only have five questions, so uh, I'll, I'll ask a couple of them. Uh, the slowdown uh, feeling 
I've never smoked marijuana. I don't use much alcohol. Uh, and probably my nerves are too hot. <laughs> mm. But um, is there neurological uh, comparative thinking in terms of uh, resting the nerves? I mean, does cannabis, I mean, there's this reaction, relax and relaxation, I guess, yes. attraction. But it, is there really science that says at least the relaxation gives your nerves a rest or a break, or is the cost of doing it, you know, counterproductive? So the question is, you know, do, does the relaxation you get, uh, is that compensated for by some harm in the nervous system that makes it in the long term a bad deal? Um, I don't think we know that. Uh, there's certainly people use it for, feels good, you know, like all drugs, euphoria, relaxation. I would say most casual cannabis users are going to be fine. I mean, if that's all you, if you use cannabis occasionally, you're almost certainly going to be fine. When people use any drug a lot, there is potential for tolerance and kind of rebound effects. So the one people may know with, uh, you know, if you take opioids for a very long period for pain, you may end up finding you're more, you're hyperalgesic, you're more sensitized to pain. So some people may feel, you know, after a lot of heavy use, they start to get really edgy in a way they weren't before. But that's at the end, that's at the people who are using a lot. So. I hope that's helpful. Hi. Um, I, so I had a question about the potency levels. And so is this increasing potency that we see now, has that been a trend that's been increasing over time? Or is this something that's linked to legalization, where a state legalizes it, and all of a sudden we see these high potency rates? That's a great question. So it was, is potency caused by legalization? I was just reading on the plane out here a European study in a bunch of countries that do not have uh, legalization, and they also have experienced an increase in potency. Potency gives is an advantage to sellers in legal and illegal markets. It makes, uh, you know, you get more bang for the buck. It's also easier to transport because the product is smaller, and you're more likely to get the person addicted, and so then they come back and you make money. The, the, for a long time, the theory was, they say there's an iron law of prohibition. It's the prohibition that makes the drug more potent. People cope with prohibition. No, because we're seeing that in legal markets too. They do. It's just an advantage to sellers. The difference is, in a legal market, you actually might be able to do something about it, which you can't really do with a street corner dealer, right? But, but in a legal market, you could say, no, oh, there's a limit on, just like the, you know, the vodka can only be so strong, where the cannabis can only be so strong. Hi, I just have a question about uh, marijuana legalization on the workplace, uh, especially recreational marijuanas. We know there's policies about workplace drug free, but mostly um, on federal jobs. So I just wanna know some of your insights on um, legalization on especially private sector jobs and et cetera. Yeah, yeah, well, how about all of our jobs if you're in the university? It, it's, yeah. it's, it's, if you get federal grants, uh, you're subject to the uh, Drug Free Workplace Act. So um, this is one of multiple areas where the, the federal law and the state law are really at loggerheads. And the way this has been handled so far is just kind of pretending that it is not the case. And I'm, I'm against doing that for multiple reasons. One is I, I, you know, I think it's unsustainable. But two, you know, two, that means at any moment, li literally, a new president could come in, a new attorney general, and arrest everybody. Every, all, they're all committing federal felonies, right? And so I think you have to give people some indication of what is the law, how do you not get in trouble, and how, 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 how can you, because people can't obey the law if it's not clear what it is, it's not fair. So that, uh, I, I, we have to have a general, some kind of meeting of minds, you know, between, including for those states who have no interest in doing this. Employers will still have, though, an interest in stopping drugs at work. You know, I, drinking is legal. I can't show up drunk to work. There'd be consequences. So that's okay. I mean, it doesn't, that, that's, you know, that's actually say, a social good. It doesn't abridge anyone's rights to say you can't be, you know, high while you drive the school bus. You know? They got a mic for you there. Um, have you looked at, um, Re, uh, legalization regimes compared to abuse rates to look and to see which legalization regime leads to the least amount of abuse rates. Mm -hmm. And by abuse rate, do you mean within the market or within the country? I mean for users. 
yeah. rates of abuse, like you know, like we have rates of alcohol abuse. Right. So, so the question is, what does legalization do in terms of the rate of people who have problems, you know, abuse abuse the substance? So, if you look at alcohol, 10% of the country drinks half of it. So we have enormous concentration of consumption in, in legal markets like we do illegal markets. The, the whether you, if you look at the rate within everyone who uses it, that changes for a different reason because legalization brings in a lot of non-problem users. So you, know, the, the, so you could look and say, well, among all consumers, a smaller proportion are, are abusing, but that's because you have a lot more moderate users who wouldn't use it when it was illegal and now will. Um, it is clear that abuse is a huge advantage to sellers. Addiction is an advantage to sellers. So everybody wants to maximize it, legal and illegal. The hope would be we'd have more control in the legal market than in the illegal market with this drug. On the other hand, a cynic could say, well, then how, did, how does tobacco kill 7 million human beings a year on this planet? You're pretty crappy at this, aren't you, you know, governments? And, and, and I understand that cynicism. Um, and alcohol, too, 3 million deaths a year. Right, but yeah. I guess my question is, have you looked at different legalization regimes to see which is the best, you were talking about the yeah. Dutch example, and they're tweaking it, so which is the, you know, if, if New York State is looking at this, what's the best mix comparatively that you've seen from the research to minimize that rate? Yeah, so the qu question is, you know, can we compare regimes and look at uh, abuse rates? At this moment, we can't. Got to remember how new this is. You know, it's a massive change, and it's just started. And we probably don't, won't know the full scope of what this is like for you know 10 or, or 20 years. But we certainly know we can we can apply generic rules that are true in other things. When a drug's cheaper, people use it more. When a drug's potent, people are more likely to be addicted to it. So you can work on those things, and you know, in your legalization regime, to try to reduce the you know, the end state of people having you know very bad experiences. Yeah. Hi. Um, Hi. My name is Dessa Burdensico, and I had a question about um, looking at it from the federal perspective with the VA, and if you have any um, insights in terms of what might be coming along in terms of legislative changes at the federal level, given that there's mounting um, scientific evidence of benefits for some people regarding pain, um, sleep, and questions around PTSD with cannabis use. Veterans are certainly using it, but there's a kind of a tug and pull in terms of um, being able to be prescribed under VA guidelines. So I think that, that at yeah. that federal level, that's going to shift the argument. I just don't know if you have any insight as to how no, that's going to go. It's a great question. I can remember when I was on the Marijuana Commission and um, talking to Congressman Huffman, and he said at that time he thought most things with the VA would would change. And he, he pointed out like the vote to allow VA doctors to talk two patients had just lost, and he said it lost this time by like 10 votes. And, he goes, and three years ago, it lost by 50 votes. So I suspect you're going to see over time a change if, if the federal law changes, right? Because you still have this, you know, the, the thing is it's a Schedule One drug, so it can't be prescribed medically. But it's, I think, quite possible that it will be moved off that schedule, and then you could prescribe it like the Brits do in their NHS. You know, it could be prescribed in the VA. And, you know, it have to be well studied. I mean, what, one of the things about talking about the benefits or the, or, or the harms of marijuana as a medicine for, say, PTSD is, in a way, it's kind of like asking, what is the effect of pills? You say, well, pills, well, what, what's in the pill? What's the dose? How often do you take them? And, and you'd have to answer all those questions to actually give it out as medicine. What doctors do now is just a recommendation but they don't do what they would normally do, saying, take this many at this strength at this point, because we don't know enough to tell them that. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Hi. I'd like to ask what the threat to the public health is, or I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. What does addiction look like in terms of personal health? compared to the um, prohibition's cost to the public health? Um, well, that's a good question. I mean, uh, you, you clearly have costs for both. 
and you also have people who have really different utilities. So there's people who look at 1.5 million people in prison and say, that's OK, I don't care. And then there's people who look at it as monstrous. So there's a subjective element here that's a political element, which do you think is worse? I, um, what, what people actually look like, what they come in and complain of most commonly with cannabis is, um, I can't concentrate, I'm having bad grades, I'm having short-term memory, or I am unable to be motivated to do anything, which is a, 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 just, just I want to use cannabis, but I, I cannot get organized to do anything else in my life. None of those things kill people. Um, they can make life pretty bad. I mean, you know, dry, you know, not finishing school, having a bad job, I mean, it can be a lot rougher. But it's not, it's not like heroin, you know, where people are dropping dead from it. So it's less severe in that sense. On the other hand, it's more, probably going to be more prevalent because a lot more people are going to be using it. So it gets to be sort of a complicated calculation of how many people at that level of harm equals this big aggregate that we don't really know. And then you have to weigh against the other side, what is the harm you know, from arrests and things like that. I would add that prohibition, if you know, one of the, people, the harms of prohibition would be arrests. Just point out, you can actually get rid of arrests and still maintain prohibition on production and sale. And that's what the point about decriminalization, you can almost get rid of them. So we have more than one way to reduce harms of enforcement beyond creating an industry that ends up addicting a lot of people. So I, I hope that's helpful, but maybe not. So a lot of the um, of your slides had this sort of historical perspective um, with respect to potency and mm -hmm. price and things like that. I guess I'm curious, you know, how do we know these things in the past? Could you just say a little bit about where the data come from before there was this legalization? How do we know prices? How do we know potency? Um, yeah. where, where does that information come from? Um, you, you know prices by asking people what they pay. Um, and it's generally not very surprising, just like you can go on a college campus and ask, you know, what, what's, you know, what does marijuana go for? What, what's the good, what, what is the, the brickweed cost? What is the Cincinnati cost? And so that, that's how it's done, just by survey, survey research on prices, yeah. So there's some systematic data collection over time asking those questions? Um, no, not on all of them. Some places, the European data is that way um, and is pretty, pretty good. Potency, you are getting it from samples, oftentimes samples taken, you know, from, by law enforcement that are sent and evaluated. So there's, a, there's enormous error in any visual measurement, but you have a gazillion measurements over a very long time. And it's amazing how consistent the story is in canvas markets here and in, and in Europe. So as we know, obviously the data would be better on both of those in a legal market. Hi, so I uh, saw that you were a professor at Stanford in mm -hmm. California. Are you currently teaching a class there, or do you just do research there in general? And if so, are you just here at Syracuse, or are you doing a tour of lectures on the East Coast? Oh. So that's a, uh, um, I'm just here at Syracuse. I'm not just here. I'm, I'm here at Syracuse. <laughs> <laughs> And ha happy to be here, and I'm going back home. But yeah, I do teach uh, uh, in psychiatry residency. So people get an MD, and then they specialize in psychiatry, and they take 12-week uh, courses uh, on addiction. And so I teach that course every year. And I also do teaching in the law school, including a lot of cannabis stuff. So we've had some really fun problems where like the legislature has charged us and said, what do we do about you know, cannabis impaired driving. How do you measure it and what should the law say? And we have these terrific bright law students who dig into all the precedents and, and then we you know, go up to Sacramento together and they say, here's what we know and here's what we don't know and here's, here's what we need to know more about. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm very interested to hear your insights on uh, a little more about youth and children. Mm -hmm. um, obviously much of the research that's been done has been done about adults, but as we think about making policy today and how that affects our future, that's our kids. Um, I run the children's hospital, and mm -hmm. I see the everyday effects of increased drug utilization, really a tremendous increase in mental health disorders in youth, not just teens. Yeah. And I'm concerned about the increased potency and the increased um, normalization that we seem to be seeing in society, and just would love to hear your comments as we think about the future of our community. So that question was about uh, what is the impact on youth uh, and, and uh, uh, what are we seeing in hospitals and what about these high potency products? So, so far, 
you can't really argue that legalization has changed the proportion of youth that use. There's states you could say here it went up, but there's other states it went down. So we don't know, maybe that'll be, you know, that'll turn out to be good in terms of just the number of young people using because you, you would hope legal merchants would be more likely to, you know, implement carding and of course it's imperfect and all that like the alcohol system is, but it might reduce access. And also if the black market shrinks, that'll, that'll take away uh, some options for them. In terms of the higher potency products, a lot of my colleagues are seeing more kids, particularly coming in with cannabis-induced transient psychotic episodes or panic attacks. And a lot of those, those, those kids have mental health problems as well. And they, you know, take the bite of the, you know, the, the candy bar and they don't realize this is really, really strong. And they flip out and it's really frightening. Now, of course, it's not, as you know, it's not fatal, thankfully, but it's a, it's a pretty, uh, uh, upsetting, challenging experience. It also creates costs, puts people in the ER, that kind of thing. There seems to be more of that going on, those kinds of, um, of so of the, of, the, of the, even though the number of young people are using, the ones who are experiencing those sorts of harm seems to be going up. There's different data on that, on like ER data. There's also some accidental poisonings, um, because, and I, which, I, which I think would be a lot less of a problem if we didn't let people make candies that look like kids' candy. Of course, a kid's gonna eat a cookie or a candy that looks like a kid's cookie or candy. That's what kids do. Um, but you know we, the, that that's a frightening moment for a kid. That's a frightening moment for a family when when that happens, and uh, those are harms. I don't think we need to have those harms though if we were tough enough on on, on the regs. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, one of the things that I found most striking in the presentation was the increase in use when it was commercialized. When you mm. have business, like. Is it just marketing, or is it ease of convenience? Are they putting additives to make people more addicted to? Like, what? Can you talk a little bit more yeah. about that? Yeah. So, I mean, that we just have the Dutch example, and that may not that that does not cover all the range of things that people could do. But one was opening more outlets, so you're just exposed to it more. It's easier. It's like anything, you know. It's less. It's lowering cost. I don't have to go as far. It's more available for people who are trying to stop using, who are Q dependent. Um, more ad, more ads, or more like say, gosh, I really feel like I'd like to get some, you know, more cannabis right now, um, and uh, you know, and sale pr and promotions. So again, people are very sensitive to price. So the, you know, two for one, all you can smoke, you know, buy a month's worth, that kind of stuff at a lower price is going to, you know, stimulate more use. We'll come up with far more things than that because we're Americans and not Dutch people. And as, actually, as, as Mark Mark Kleiman said, the Dutch show what you can do when you have a, a small homogenous country that spent 500 years trying to keep the water out under the watchful eye of the Dutch Reformed Church. Right. <laughs> so that ain't, that ain't us. <laughs> so we, so we'll go we'll go much more. You know. I, I have a, a very hard question, I think. Um, clearly, the policies and uh, proposals that you recommend are in some implicit sense connected with your or our understanding of the consequences of um, marijuana. And then you describe some research agenda where we would learn more about marijuana. Can you just give us, in some impressionistic sense, how more knowledge about marijuana would affect the policies that, that you've been describing? Yeah, so the question was, you know, if we had more knowledge, uh, if we did the research, big grants, big grants, <laughs> what, how would it actually be applied and what would be the regulatory impact? So here's just a very simple thing. Is it in fact worse for you to consume these really strong, high products, these 30, 40, 50, you know, 60%? Maybe it's not. If it's not, we could back off on regulating those. My idea of a potency cap would be the wrong one. If on the other hand, you see the other way that people are you know, more likely to go in the ER, or even the you know, the worst possible case would be that people who are have families, they have a family history of serious mental illness, are more likely to have a psychotic break and and things like that. Then you would that would bring you the case more to say, okay, no, we should really be tightening tightening the uh, the links on this. The issue of substitution, particularly on alcohol, is hugely important. I think there are a lot of people who are, you know, there's a small number of people who care intensely about cannabis 
legalization or not. And then there's a lot of people who are, it's, it's, it wouldn't be on their 10 top issues. But if you, but they would want to know, um, what if it, would this in fact make people consume less alcohol or more alcohol? And that would affect their judgments a lot. So it'd be good for to give to give voters the accurate information. If it in fact reduces alcohol, I think there's a lot of people who say, you know, I don't like it that much, but if you can cut the number of drunk driving accidents, the number of drunken punch ups, I'm for it. Or if it makes it worse, they would say, you know, I was I was on the fence, but I don't want any more. Yeah, and not that I care about cannabis, but if this is going to increase drinking, I think there's we have enough problems with alcohol that we can't solve. I don't want to do it. Those are just some examples. Um, so by definition, I can only speculate because of the question like what what we actually find. You know, that's that's the the mystery of science, right? You know, what what it'll turn out to be, and I'm sure it'll be things that surprise me utterly. Um, if it's good work. In Canada, across the country, they had had, before legalization, a number of storefronts that were called National Access Cannabis. Mm -hmm. And they were, they were places of education mm -hmm. for the public to teach the public about cannabis, about cannabis use, about cannabis products, about microdosing cannabis. Mm -hmm. Not everyone wants to get whacked. So are there any efforts being made in this country to do something similarly? I think what we've found is that most education is being done in the, the storefronts themselves. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think if you, I mean, if you go into a dispensary, you know, for example, you will get all kinds of advice about what strain, what potency, you know, uh, uh, and, and as well as, you know, for what ailment, I'm not saying it's all true, but the, you know, absolutely the whole, the, the culture of you know, consumer culture, I think, is alive and well and around that. Um, I don't think public health departments are doing very much right now. I, I, my, my read on them is they're kind of in a defensive crouch. They, they're they're afraid of being, they're afraid of being a blue rinse uh, mom from the 1980s, and they say like, you know, I don't want to be one of those. It's like, but it's legal now, so that's that's over with. So now you're a public health person. So your job is to tell the public what is this and what does it do, and you just need to do it straight facedly like you would for. Uh, you know, a, a pharmaceutical for like alcohol, like tobacco, whatever. Um, and I don't think there's enough of that, enough of that happening. There's also a question like what, what information do you get on the packaging? So this is one of the things and we worked on a lot with the state of Washington, really like making sure people can tell what in fact they're consuming. And the industry's record on that is very poor. Every audit study has shown that what is, you know, the product is said to be is very commonly not what it is. And if that's true, then you can't educate the public because you say, here's what you want. They say, okay, that's what I want, but it's not what they thought they were going to get. So the, there needs to be some maturation of industry and regulation such that when something says this is a 6% cookie, uh, you know, in its cannabis indica, that it in fact is. One more final question. In areas where uh, cannabis is being legalized, are there initiatives, like intentional initiatives, to work with black market dealers to enter the industry? Thanks for your question. So in area, the question was, in areas where we're legalizing, are efforts being made to bring people out of illicit markets into the illicit market? This is something I really wanted to do in the California um, uh, ballot initiative, and we emphasize on the question. We, 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 how we phrase it was low-income communities of color. That basically, they, you experience the damage of the arrests. You should therefore be in on the gold rush, right? There were challenges in doing this um, because I, I had the idea of doing like a, a set aside program, and then and then I found out that was illegal. Uh, it was like a, considered discriminatory or something, and even people, you know. But so so they they are trying to do like different sort of educational efforts on things like how do you get the license and all this kind of stuff. But there's a huge, they're at, that, that those kinds of folks are at such a disadvantage from the slick companies, you know, people who are, you know, have whole teams of lawyers to work all this stuff out. So that's another reason why, by the way, I favor the state store, I like the state store model, is because government has just done, you know, whatever we do wrong, we, we are a much more diverse workforce and we do much more uh, getting people in than you're gonna see in a private industry. Um, and you know, and it really is done. Another thing we mentioned in the paper I didn't have into here that would help is expungement of prior convictions. So for a lot of people, they won't be able to get a license because they're you know, a criminal, but you could say, all right, well now that it's legal, we're just gonna wipe, wipe that and give you a shot to be a legal, come out of the shadows and be a legal business person.
Great, so let's thank Dr. Humphreys for his excellent presentation. Thank you. And please stay and join us for the reception in the back. Thank you. Oh, it's at seven in the morning.